this uh, webinar. I'm Augustina uh, from Superstar Education Jakarta. I will be host today. And thank you for Atma Jaya University for Ms. Citra as a head of Department Hospitality at Majaya University BSD Campus. And thank you for Mizarin as a PIC for this event today. Also, thank you for the hotel schools, Mr. Tim Radling. Thank you, Mr. Fernando. And thank you, Mr. Doni. Also, we have uh, Ms. Tuti from Superstar Education Surabaya. Hello, Ms. Tuti. Good morning. Okay. Um, a quick introduction about Superstar Education. We are services for study overseas, especially on some country like Australia, uh, Singapore, and Malaysia. We base office on the Sydney, but we have office also in uh, Melbourne. Okay, uh, quick introduction to Superstar Education services. We are willing to assist you to achieve your future being study overseas and the destination country. We do not stop service for our students. We are start giving for free consultation for the choose a university and IELTS preparation. We are also arrange application, accommodations, health insurance and visa for our students. Before we are start, I will give opportunity to Ms. Chitra for welcoming our students. Ms. Chitra, please. Uh, thank you, Ms. Augustine. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. We are pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have joined our seminars and our webinars before, as well as those of you who just joined us. I would like to especially welcome Superstar Education, as well as the Hotel School Australia, specifically to Mr. Tim Rudling as Director of International, Mr. Fernand Pimentel as the International Marketing Executive, as well as our guest speaker for today, and Mr. Doni as In-Country Manager for Indonesia. Uh, this is actually our second collaboration in the form of a seminar. On this case, it is a webinar. I would like to express my gratitude to Superstar Education and the Hotel School Australia for making this happen. Our topic for today webinar is marketing for the hospitality industry in the new normal. I believe this is an important, vital, and informative topic for us all. We all know that the pandemic today has hit a lot of industry, and one of the industry that was hit the hardest is the hospitality industry. So in order to awaken this industry again, a good marketing strategy is needed and even maybe a specific marketing strategy will be needed in the new normal. So I have no doubt that today we will be enlightened on this. So uh, without further ado, I will call upon Ms. Agustin again to explain about the rules to follow before starting today's webinar. Okay, uh, thank you Ms. Chitra uh, for welcoming our audience. And uh, before we start also this presentation by Mr. Fernando, so I will give you uh, some rules for this uh, webinar. Uh, during this webinar session, uh, during the presentation will be able, so uh, feel free audience to drop your question on the question box because we will be mute for all our audience. So uh, we will go ahead for presentation about ma uh, marketing for hospitality industry by Mr. Fernando Pimentel. Mr. Fernando, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much. A very warm thank you to uh, Agustina, to Superstar Shinta, uh, to Zarin, to Citra, uh, to Tim, to Donnie, for this fantastic opportunity to be here today to share a little bit about uh, this exciting topic around marketing for hospitality in the era of the new normal. It's a highly topical um, 
area to discuss given the circumstances we are facing. But before we jump into the topic, I would like just to um, share a few things with all of you. So just to commence, just a brief bio. My name is Fernando Pimentel. I've been living in Sydney, Australia for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, I am uh, very excited because I am the international marketing executive working with the hotel school. Uh, a lot of the, the things we do, uh, the key focus is to uh, show, showcase the hotel school to pot potential students because we offer some really exciting alternatives and opportunities for students. I've been in the industry for 10 plus years, working in marketing. I'm very passionate about education. Education is really, really close to my heart because I can see the power, the, trans the transformative power of education in people's lives. That's why education is so close to my heart. And that is why I'm really excited to be here to deliver this talk, uh, this guest lecture today. I'm a proud father of one small boy uh, who's four years old, who keeps me going. His name is Noah, a very small, very curious little boy. And uh, I'm also very fond of sports. And just to, to give you a bit of context of what exactly is the nature of today's talk. So we'll start a little bit about who is the hotel school just to, sh to share with you uh, our expertise in, in this particular area of study, which is hotel management, tourism, and hospitality. We then will look into the state of the industry, what's happening in the industry today, what are the forces that are driving this industry today? And then we'll have a look at disruptions in the hotel industry, which is also a very topical issue, a very topical uh, point that needs to be analyzed and discussed. And then, as part of the title of this uh, presentation, we, we will look at what are some of the new things that will become new initiatives uh, being implemented by hotels and the tourism industry at large, which will constitute the new normal. And then we'll have a look at marketing in this new era. Okay, so what, what do future uh, marketers and current marketers need to think about? when looking at this particular industry and the challenges being posed. And finally, we will conclude with a Q&A uh, with an opportunity to open up for questions, okay? So without further ado, just briefly highlight who we are. So the Hotel School is a unique partnership between industry and education, uh, combining on one side, the academic excellence of Southern Cross University on the other side, we have MOFA. MOFA is a uh, leader in the uh, property section uh, with a, port a vast portfolio of premium and luxury brands in resorts, hotels, ski resorts, and whatnot. Uh, we celebrated 30 years last year, so it's, an, it's a very, very exciting time for the hotel school. These are just some of the reasons why the hotel school is in such a privileged position to offer students a pathway to success. Success in an industry that is growing. Uh, yes, at the moment is facing some challenges, but hey, we're all, the whole world is facing challenges at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, founded in 1989, started out as a, a school within the um, intercontinental Sydney to prepare future leaders of the hotel industry. And as you can see, we're also proud of our campus locations across the, the heart of the CBDs in Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. We have unique industry connections, which assists our students to be well-placed in the market through internships and later on through uh, jobs, okay? And we're also very proud of the fact that we are a melting pot, if you will. We, are a, we offer a combination of different nationalities and this is the perfect environment for students to come because the hospitality, the hotel and tourism uh, industries are all focused on this globality, this uh, diversity in terms of uh, nationality. So this is a reality that ev any future hotelier, any future uh, worker in this industry will have to deal with a globalized environment. So this is something we're really proud of. 
So quickly, I just wanted to showcase, MOFA is not a household name, but it does have some key properties like the intercontinental Sydney with this beautiful view of the Harbor Bridge, the intercontinental Hayman Island, it's, a, it's paradise on earth. We also have Sanctuary Cove, a beautiful property. Uh, ben Bajan, which is a, a beautiful property, which is in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Uh, the Maritz Hotel, a ski, re, a ski resort. Uh, we also own the London Marriott, beautiful property in the heart of London. The Sofitel Paris, beautiful property in France. The largest Sofitel in the world, which is the Sofitel Plaza Manila. Uh, the Novotel in Hong Kong. So you can see from this transi transition of slides that the hotel school through MOFA has a fantastic portfolio ranging from luxury uh, resorts, which is the case of Hayman Island, to uh, five-star properties in the hearts of the CBDs. And the, a good example here is the intercontinental Sydney. Okay, so enough about that. Let's uh, start our conversation, our uh, guest lecture around the state of the industry. Now, this is a really important topic because COVID-19, the pandemic, has uh, pretty much involved the whole world. But before we go into that, let's have a look at the tourism and travel industry. The tourism and travel uh, industry is a comprehensive industry that encompasses hotels, airlines, uh, all, all sorts of services related to the, so this is a massive industry, okay? So just to give you a snapshot of this industry, according to the World Travel and Tourism, uh, this is a key organization that pretty much offers a lot of insights into the industry. So just to give you guys a big picture view of this, how amazing this industry is. In 2019, last year, travel and tourism's direct, indirect and induced impact accounted for. So what do I mean by, what do we mean by direct? Direct has to do with all the jobs directly related to this industry. But as we know, this industry is not playing by itself. There are a series of other industries that are secondary, and, and for that reason, they offer an indirect support to the main industry, okay? So if we look at the whole, in 2019, last year, uh, the contribution of travel and tourism to the world economy, not just Australia, United States, the whole world, was to the order of 8.9 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars. That was the contribution to the global domestic or gross domestic product of the world. So every single service product that was manufactured around the world across different industries, tourism and travel contributed with 8.9 trillion. That, to give you perspective in relative terms, that represents 10% of the global GDP. Okay, so just to show you the power and the the, the, the penetration of this industry across the world. What does that mean? That uh, equates to 330 million jobs. So this is an industry that is growing year on year and is an industry that offers a high degree of employability. So to put this again in perspective, one in 10 jobs around the world is generated within the travel and tourism industry. So this is really, really important. And it's something that uh, we're very proud to be part of with the hotel school. Also, just to give you some context, uh, the travel and tourism had 1.7 trillion visitor experts. This means people traveling around the world, right? $948 billion in capital investment. So this is also a very important indicator of how attractive this industry is to investors. A lot of investors building new hotels, uh, new resorts, building the infrastructure to allow this amazing industry to continue to prosper. So there's a lot of activity, investment, and as you can see, growth in this amazing industry. So 
To conclude on this slide, what we can say, a key takeaway is that up until 2019, we have seen a fantastic growth, which has led this industry to become one of the biggest in the world and a fantastic opportunity to offer secure employment for uh, people who decide to work with this. Just to give you some context, we get on the, on the left side of the screen, sector GDP growth. So just to show you that if we get all the industries across the world, the number one was information and communication. So year on year growth, it had almost 5%. Then you see that in third place, which is very high, you see that travel and tourism had a 3.5 year on year growth in sector GDP. So that's how much the industry has been going, has been growing, excuse me. And the uh, chart to the right shows you exactly the contribution per country. So we have the top 15 countries there with the biggest uh, GDP related to tourism and uh, travel. And you can see that for the United States, for example, it's 1.8 trillion. That's the amount that was the contribution for that particular economy. Then I would like to highlight the numbers on the second column. So if, if you can see China, for example, China had a 9.3 year on year growth. That's how much the uh, tourism and the travel and tourism sector grew for China. So a lot of activity happened in travel and tourism in China specifically. If we look at number 10, number 10, India, again, almost 5%. So uh, China, India, and the Philippines grew over the average rate of growth. So this is to show you that it is an intense, uh, it is a highly active uh, industry with a growth, unprecedented growth, if I may say, across the globe. And if you look as far as the, uh, the whole world is concerned, travel and tourism is and continues to grow. It's top, top three, okay? So just to give you some context, okay. So now that we understand a little bit about the travel and tourism industry, it's important for us to have a look at the current environment. What is actually happening at the moment? Okay, so this is an interesting uh, case study, if you will, because on one side we see hotels. Hotels have been historically highly successful in generating uh, accommodation, and experiences uh, throughout the world and throughout history. And they were pretty much uh, alone in this space, right? Up until 2008, when a disruption occurred in the market. So what do I mean by disruption? Disruption in industry, in business, in hospitality, in technology, a disruption is a process that uh, questions the status quo. So if in the past it was just about hospitality and hotel management and hotels were the only places to offer accommodation, in 2008, in 2008, what did we see? We saw the rise of disruptors. These disruptors are companies, startups that offer accommodation. And a, an, an interesting example is Airbnb, right? So Airbnb doesn't own a single room. It only has individuals who uh, are able to share their accommodation. They pay a fee for that. And that's how, they, that's how the business model pretty much works. Okay. However, something happened between 2008 and now, which kind of disrupted the disruptor. Okay. And a lot of this has to do with COVID-19. So just to give you some context, who is Airbnb? Airbnb is an American online marketplace. It's based in San Francisco. It is a company that when it started, it had a really, really clear vision to create accommodation that was affordable. It was uh, avail widely available in every single country and easy to use. So technology was uh, the underpinning uh, premise that moved Airbnb forward, right? That and affordability of rates, okay? 
So what was their offering? What is their offering? Airbnb offer arrangement of lodging. So lodging means where you, you can stay and uh, houses, uh, apartments, flats are all part of that. But they also uh, offer a tourism experience, right? Because wherever you go, depending on the location you choose, you will have a specific experience that as a traveler you want to uh, go through. And Airbnb is a facilitator in that process. Okay, founded in August 2008 by uh, the visionary Brian Chesky. He is a co-founder of Airbnb. And interesting to say that uh, their revenue by the year of two, uh, 2017 reached $2.6 billion in revenue. That's, uh, that's impressive to see because the uh, hotel industry is a very well-established industry. Barriers of entry to this industry are quite high. You need a lot of capital. That's why Airbnb is a disruptor because it changed the way that the industry did uh, business pretty much by allowing people to share their homes. And that made them really successful. It famously, for that matter, disrupted the hotel industry, stealing market share, putting pressure on hotel rates, and it inspired the creation of affordable brands. So affordability, when we, later today, we will discuss a few of the concepts related to marketing. And one key point in marketing, in addition to promotion, to product and service is price. Price is really important because it could serve, it can be used as a barrier to entry. People that are price sensitive are often not able to enter a specific market, but Airbnb ensured that a lot of people could actually enter this market as consumers and also those who became their partners. So how has Airbnb disrupted the hotel industry? Well, the first, the very first clear point is affordable accommodations. Again, a whole bunch, a big chunk of the market that would otherwise be left alienated has been uh, taken on board by Airbnb. So this is a segment that was being neglected and Airbnb saw the opportunity uh, to decide to tap into that market. So affordable affordability, a lower price, the fact that they were able to personalize the hotel pricing through their technology and their booking systems, the cultural experiences they, that they were, were able to uh, offer uh, travelers and uh, people in this industry is also unprecedented. So they really relied this in using their marketing. They focused on the needs of the user, right? On the tourists, travelers, uh, the fact that they had the flexibility to often to offer last minute options is something that also helped to bring Airbnb to the masses and hence have connections. And finally, the fact that they were able to build personal connections to their guests, right? And not just to their guests, but the people who were part of the network of partners. So this has to do with the people who sublet their properties or their rooms to Airbnb. So just to give you a situation analysis, right? For years, home sharing has put pressure on rates. And so hotel rates and occupancy are two very, very important and strategic uh, success indicators in the hotel industry. Hotel rates, how much you pay for a room and occupation uh, has to do, let's say you have 100 rooms, you have an occupation rate of 90% means that from the 100 rooms, you have 90% of them are taken by guests. The higher the occupancy rate, the more, uh, the more successful the hotel and the higher the chances of uh, revenue uh, increasing and profitability. So this is paramount in this particular industry. So Airbnb did put a lot of pressure in hotels, right? Because they started to compete and offering lower prices, they stole a, a, a good segment of the market. Uh, however, not everything was going well with Airbnb. In spite of all the, the, the fact that they stole market share, they put pressure on hotels, they did have a few issues. Uh, specifically, quite recently, as of last year, they had some very large expenses uh, including safety. So they had to review their safety because as you know, Airbnb 
uh, you know, they have different houses, different apartments. Every single room is very different. Uh, so it's very hard to maintain that consistency. So they had, to in, they had to make a massive investment in safety, in technology, right? In marketing to promote their, um, their rooms and their services and acquisitions. They did buy a few properties. Last year, interesting enough, uh, in, the first, in the first nine months of 2019, Airbnb posted the loss of $322 million hit their bottom line really, really hard, right? Just to put things in perspective, during the same period of time, one year uh, before, they had registered a profit of $200 million. So that started to put things in a bit of a, uh, a pickle, in a bit of uh, difficulty for Airbnb. And come 2020, the COVID situation, the pandemic, people are not traveling. They already had a very fragile bottom line. What happens? People are not traveling anymore. People are stranded. And we have a, a situation where Airbnb had now, in this particular year, to lay off a quarter of its workforce. So as you can see, the disruptor back in 2008 is now facing a massive disruption through COVID-19 and other situations that have put this particular brand in a very delicate situation. So what is the problem? Uh, that is uh, the, the hotel industry, the tourism industry. What is the problem that is being faced by every single one today? The industry has been, has been hit hard, given the fact that borders are closed, a lot of restrictions are in place. And what is happening now is that the industry is doing everything it can. Hotels are working really hard to find creative solutions, which we will see later today, to recover from this crisis. So the contest between hotels and home shares, so hotels like um, Accor, Sheraton, uh, Formula One, you name it, and Airbnb, uh, they're fighting really hard to maintain their position and also to continue to attract guests, right? So the moment now is a very tough moment. They are struggling. And one of the key points that they have to take into consideration moving forward is that they need to reassure the public, which means future travelers and guests, that their rooms are virus free. So this is really reshaping the industry, right? It's really now a matter of safety. Uh, people are concerned that when the lockdown goes away, they're, they're thinking, there is research that shows us that consumers are highly concerned. Is it going to be safe to travel again? That's the biggest, question mark on every single consumer's mind. And as a matter of fact, on every single marketer's mind who work for uh, hotels, hospitality, and tourism, because they're really worried, okay? They also have to ensure that the terms are fair. In other words, the terms, the agreement terms to stay at Airbnb, for example, need to be fair. There has been a lot of consumer backlash, negative feedback that Airbnb wasn't really being fair with, um, some of their guests. They were getting a lot of complaints, right? Another key word is social distancing. So with COVID-19, with this disruption that everyone is facing, social distancing is a key issue. And when you think about a service like hotel management and hospitality, which is a highly social kind of service because it, it's all about gathering and harboring people, accommodating people. So. Hotels, have you ever seen a hotel with only one guest? You have never seen one. Neither have I. Because hotels gather hundreds of people. They gather lots of people. So how do you maintain the hygiene standards, social distancing, and how do you manage with uh, the, the terms and policies? Because that's something really important, especially now where consumers are so concerned. So what I wanted to say and highlight in this particular point here is that social distancing, hygiene, and refund policies have a high degree of becoming the real game changers for this industry, okay? Again, to put things in perspective, so in the first few slides, we saw the state of the industry. We saw how big and how the impact that the tourism and uh, travel industry has around the world. So just to put things in perspective, uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council 
uh, is working on a series of different studies. And this study here particularly is really impressive because it shows that there is a, they, they are projecting uh, for this year, uh, 100.8 million jobs are going to have to uh, be cut back or revised or, uh, you know, they, they'll have to review that. So that's a 31% uh, reduction. And they're also estimating that because of this uh, lack of acceleration, given the fact that we have COVID being quite aggressive, that will translate into a retraction of the global GDP for tourism in the house or in the uh, in around 2.7 trillion US dollars. That's a 30% retraction. Okay, again, to put things in perspective, this current pandemic is having the economical and financial impact, which is equitable to five times the impact of the 2008 global financial crisis, because this crisis has hit everybody, okay? Okay, so the situation now is a challenging situation. Yes, indeed. However, uh, the hotel industry, the travel industry, they have been working very hard. Right? They have been observing the situations, they have been working with government, they have been studying solutions to alleviate this impact, okay? And what is being considered by a lot of, or by many um, specialists in the, in the sector is the solution has to deal and has to tackle straight on the, um, the, the matter that impacts the hotel management, the hotel management industry, the most, which is the hygiene factor, which is the social distance. And so, the solution now being proposed by major five-star hotel brands is cleaning standards that are uh, paramount, that are uh, just uh, precisely what they needed. So these new stringent hygiene and cleaning standards will play a big role in, first of all, reassuring consumers that it's safe to stay in a hotel, right? Uh, people are scared today, but there are solutions being put in place by the, by the industry. And now what all of us have to do in the industry is we need to work with the public and marketing will play a big role in this, communicating this safety, communicating these messages and measures to the public at large. So looking at the current situation, these global brands and associations are introducing clean, new cleaning standards, right? So major brands such as Accor, such as the Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt, uh, Hilton, they're all introducing this because they quickly realize the impact that uh, the virus is having. And people will only contain the proliferation of the virus with good hygiene. That's one of the key things from the beginning that the World Health Organization has advised. So major brands and associations announced in the month of May, this month, these new cleaning standards, right? What is the key focus of this? Enhanced hotel cleaning practices. So uh, if they were already very strict, they're taking this to the next level. They're being extra hard on pure hygiene, okay? Because they know this is important. Social interactions. So as in the past, we would interact a lot with uh, people working in hotels, now they are rethinking this. They are re the industry is rethinking the way that guests and staff in hotels interact, and technology will play a big role in this. Workplace protocols. So how do individuals, staff, and guests have to interact, right? So all of these points are being introduced because what they want to achieve as, 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 a, as an industry is they want to continue offering these good services, but they want to change norms that are old norms. So the topic of today is the new normal. So the hotel industry can't go back to the old normal because it's not gonna work. And this is a direct outcome of this necessity to change, to change with the times, change with uh, what we are observing, reducing risk so that when borders open up again, guests can feel safe. Uh, very important because it, it does impact uh, guests, it impacts uh, staff, and it does impact the brand 
because the brand is all about the experiences, the associations that people have. If you stay at a hotel and the hotel experience you had wasn't good, your memory of that brand will be a negative one. And what's worse is that chances are you will then give a negative feedback to your friends about that hotel brand. So marketers, uh, hotel people are very, very mindful and they understand that we need, they need to do something about it and quick. So this is an interesting quote from John Davison. John Davison is the president and chief executive officer. He's the CEO of Four Seasons. Four Seasons is a premium brand of hotels. And as you can see, uh, this is, they are highly concerned and they should be because they know how much this will impact their business. So just briefly to let you know that he was saying that within this environment, this new environment brought forward by COVID-19 and the pandemic, our singular goal is to provide guests, residents, and employees with the confidence and assurance that their health and safety is our first priority. So marketing messages based on this way of thinking, this new way of thinking, you can rest assured that that's what a lot of the marketing departments in five-star hotel brands will be communicating. The fact that they are reassuring uh, guests around the world that get their health is our top priority. Whereas in the past, it was customer satisfaction. Now we're focused on health. You know, health is paramount, right? And safety. So it's a really, really important and topical and relevant statement to be made by the leader because this will start at the top and will go down all the way to the staff level. So you rest assured that employees on their daily routines will need to reflect uh, the words of John, for example, at Four Seasons in every single thing they do at hotels. So as a part of this uh, new strategy, from um, the Four Seasons, they, in collaboration with John Hopkins, John Hopkins Med uh, Medicine International is a leader, it is a thought leader in medicine, a renowned university, and experts. And they've been covering the whole COVID pandemic. They are perhaps the official, if you wanna look at COVID numbers, they are the official uh, entity to check for, for numbers. Uh, and look at the curve and all of it, all of those things. So the Four Seasons, a leading brand in hotel management, is collaborating with a leader in the medical field. So we can see clearly here a co-branding strategy. Two strong brands, one in the hotel management and one in the health sector, combining their expertise to come up with an enhanced health and safety program. This program is called Lead with Care which reflects directly the CEO's uh, focus on taking care of guests, taking care of their safety. So how does this lead with care work? How does this program, uh, what, what, what constitutes this program? So there are three key areas. And the first one here is, believe it or not, enhanced cleanliness. So, you can see that this strategy is so focused on cleanliness and hygiene because this is, this is the new norm. This is what we're, we're gonna have to worry about moving forward. So if you are a student in hotel management, if you are a professional already working in this industry, enhanced cleanliness, moving forward is going to be part of your uh, vernacular. It's gonna be part of who you are as a professional. To the point, where Four Seasons are creating a new profession, a new occupation, a new position, which is being known or being called as the hygiene officer. In the past, you didn't have a hygiene officer. You had somebody who was responsible for cleaning, like a, the cleaning, the janitor. But now, this has become so important to the hotel industry that they have created this new uh, department and this new occupation. So just to show you that the, again, the old normal is no longer uh, feasible for the hotel industry, hence the creation of this new job. Some of you who decide to study uh, hotel management might become a hygiene officer in the future, who knows? So this is an opportunity for all of you. This is a new job being created 
now as a result of this pandemic. So there's some good news here as well. So this will definitely help the industry to bounce back because it's not just Four Seasons who is thinking about this. All hotels will need to think about this. So this is really good news for all of us. And this will involve, uh, this will involve rooms being disinfected daily with EPA approved products. So the EPA is the Environmental Protect, Protecting Protection Agency. They look after the environment. They ensure that whatever uh, chemicals and uh, elements are used to clean don't, they, they do the job that they have to do, but they don't uh, contaminate the environment. So that's really important. With this initiative, they will also focus on retraining programs for housekeeping, you know, new cleaning pro protocols, as I said. Um, and they have also nom nominated, which is really interesting, just to show you how seriously they're taking this matter, the COVID-19 advisory board, okay? So this board will be in, in charge of, you know, budgeting, uh, uh, getting the funds, getting the people trained, ensuring that they are on top of things, okay? So things such as ozone technology for air pur uh, purification has been used a lot in hospitals to purify oxygen. This will now be, they will start now using this in hotels, just to show you how sophisticated this will become. UV technology. Again, all of these things are being implemented with a clear objective in mind, guest safety. A second point which I need to highlight, which is also linked to the Lead with Care program, is heightened guest safety and comfort. So again, cleanliness and uh, keeping uh, your levels of hygiene in public spaces, guests and everything has to be at the highest standard, right? But guest safety and comfort shouldn't be ignored, right? So Lead with Care will also include kits that will be placed in guest rooms. These kits will contain masks, hand sanitizer, sanitation uh, sanitization wipes. So this is also uh, a concern. Whereas in the past you would have your little necessary kit with maybe a perfume or a shampoo. Now they're gonna be focused more in the safety, but still with a focus on comfort. So again, this is the new normal. Social distancing measures, again, really important. Uh, you know, just letting your guests know, and in this particular case here, that they have to stay one and a half meters apart. If they're going to uh, a restaurant, if they're going to a bar in a hotel, in a gym, this is the new normal. This is the future of hotel management, right? Uh, restaurants and bars. So if anybody here is interested in, in, in food and beverage, for example, which is a massive part of hotels, Restaurants and bars will have to operate with a reduced capacity because of the social distancing, right? So if in the past you could, let's say, host 100 guests, maybe you'll have to reduce this to, I don't know, 80, 70, because you need to ensure, you know, that you observe social distancing measures. And also the a la carte service, right? Whereas in the, in the past, the buffet was you know, a very popular option. But the thing with the buffet is that you're having a lot of people next to each other, right? And you have somehow an interaction uh, with other staff members. So with the a la carte, you are in your table and you're separate from the rest, okay? Another important thing here is contact, contactless delivery, okay? We see this a lot in fast food today, uh, menu log and all those delivery services, but hotel management, the hotel industry will have, to, uh, will have to look into that as well. And technology, right? Because technology is a way to create a healthy barrier between the guest and staff, right? So apps, chats, this is already being used in the, in the present moment, but this will gain a new dimension of importance, okay? So again, this will be the new normal. So interactions with the concierge with the front desk, whereas in the past, you would probably go to the desk and say, hey, I need a towel. Now, it'll be 100% contact, contact less, right? Uh, and you'll do that through an app using your phone, right? Or through a chat. And the fact that, uh, you know, in this particular case, they're looking at specifically um, translation, right? So 
uh, the convenience of translating these instructions to other languages. Empowered employees. So uh, again, I saw we were talking about the CEO. Look, if it's just about the CEO and the beautiful message, this will stop here. But at, at the moment, as you can see, they are concerned about empower, empowering their employees, which means that it doesn't stop with the CEO. It starts with the CEO, it starts with top management, with leadership, but it has to cascade down to the level of employees. And employees and staff are dealing with guests 24-7. They, they are on the co-face, the co dealing with them on a daily basis. So educating and empowering these uh, staff members is paramount. Uh, the program is grounded in emotional intelligence because in this particular point in time, what we also see is a lot of people are stressed and worried. So it is important to have empathy in relationships. So emotional intelligence, really important. How do you deal with emotions? How, you, how do you do, and for the hotel management industry, which is an industry around people, right? You're dealing with people who are unhappy, stressed, dissatisfied, right? Disgruntled sometimes. So having that emotional intelligence during and after a pandemic is going to be really important, especially because uh, guests will be doing a lot of their communication through uh, technology, right? So they won't necessarily have a person in front of them, but they'll have a person on the other end of the mobile phone or the chat. So that's very important. Uh, so again, here, just other points related to this, pro uh, to this program. Uh, the fact that they're thinking to enhance their weight-free check-in and check-out. Um, you know, this is really important because again, it's limiting the face-to-face -face interactions and whilst still offering the highest level of personal service. So it's an interesting problem that they have and they're tackling uh, primarily through the use of technology, which is really, really important. So uh, here, if you look at uh, bullet point number two, uh, chats and um, are, are so important. Today, they receive around 10 million messages, which equates to an average of 580,000 messages a month. So that's how much they've been relying to this point with technology. And as this progresses, the more they'll have to uh, rely on uh, technology. So, as I said, it's not just the Grand Hyatt. A lot of hotels have uh, this month uh, announced through marketing campaigns, through press releases, through their websites, through their blog posts, what? New initiatives. Okay, so to give you an example, Accor just launched their All Safe label and they're hashtagging All Safe. So they're using social media, they're, they're, they're hashtagging this, and eventually guests will will start using this, this hashtag as well because it's all to show, uh, it's a cool way to promote that Accor is focused in the highest standards of uh, hygiene. Uh, the Best Western uh, chain of hotels launched the We Care Clean initiative, again, focused on industry leading cleaning standards. So you can see every single major hotel brand is focused on this. This is, a, this is of strategic importance for all of these um, hotel brands. Now we go into the marketing, into the specific field of marketing. So we've looked at the industry, we've looked at some of the challenges, we, we start to have a bit of an understanding of what the big hotel brands are doing. And now we get into a, a stage of this presentation where uh, I would like to highlight uh, some of the things that were already highlighted in, in, in the previous section, but here we see how specifically this relates to marketing in this new era. So I just thought I should share this with you because <clears throat> This is, this is exactly what the hotel industry is going through. In fact, all industries are going through this new shift, this paradigm shift, right? So if in the past it was a, a very predictable road, now it's not so predictable. And this is how uh, hotel brands will have to, uh, and marketers specifically will need to think uh, about when they're putting their campaigns and programs in place. So th this here is, I think, a, a very key and important and a relevant insight by this gentleman called Henry. Uh, he is a consultant and an analyst in the lodging industry, in the hotel industry, right? 
and he's also in uh, working for the, he's the founder of Atmosphere Research Group. And this is, 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 is such a, uh, an important uh, and, and wise observation. So he says, the contactless hotel stay, right, may be considered the new luxury. This is such a powerful insight because we know, all of us know, that in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19, we need to refrain from having physical contact, right? The social distancing. So from the things we've, we've seen in the previous slides, we can see that he's absolutely spot on. The new luxury will not be necessarily a swimming pool, a golf course, even though that in the past represented luxury. The new luxury now will be the, the, the hotels, uh, the uh, properties, the resorts that are able to maintain the same level of service, but without the contact, because this, this really will um, add benefits to the industry. So this is a really good insight that I would like to leave this to you as food for thought, because it's really, really uh, important. This is a new era. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is, as we all know, a global phenomenon. It has impacted every single one of us, rich, poor, old, young, every single one, all industries, right? So virtually anyone could be at risk. And it has impacted all fronts, the economy, society, the way we live, the political agendas we see, governments are concerned and are taking action. The technology, it has impacted technology, it has made technology work uh, to help us to overcome these obstacles. The environmental, right? So the environmental, uh, it, it has a degree of, of impact that, and the legal as well, you know, because if you don't look after your guests, you could have legal implications, right? Because you're not following uh, specific criteria, specific protocols. What do I mean by all of this, right? This means that traditional ways of doing business are now becoming obsolete. We can't think, we can't solve problems using the old way of thinking, right? That's pretty much the, the key point here. We will, as marketers, we need to rethink the way our brands, products and services engage and interact with potential new customers. The old way of shaking hands, how, 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 hi, how are, you, how are you? That's not gonna be enough. It has to change. It needs to evolve. This is the new norm. Technology, hygiene, reassurance, all of these points, okay? And with every single new era, new habits come about, right? New terms come about. So this era, this new era, has forced consumers and all of us to adopt new habits. And as marketers, we need to understand what these new habits are. And we need, we need to accommodate because if our guests are not being offered an opportunity to uh, adopt these new habits, then our businesses will be impacted, right? Social isolation, social distancing, a thorough and ongoing hygiene practice, you know, contactless interactions, online engagement, and very importantly, which was very much what the CEO for Grand Hyatt said, the need for compassion. End of the day, we're dealing with people. This is a people industry. We can never forget that everything we do, all the actions we take will impact human beings, right? This is a moment of stress. It's a moment of uh, people are really worried and we need to have compassion. So this is really important. And as marketers, when we communicate, when we launch campaigns, when we uh, launch initiatives, we have to be mind very mindful, extra mindful of that. So we need to manage guests. So very important as well is to manage guest and customer perceptions, right? Because perception is something very important. You could be doing a lot in the back end, but if you're not communicating this to the public at large through savvy campaigns, through content marketing, so through social media posts, it in a way goes in vain because people don't know about it. And if you're Googling and if you're doing uh, you're searching for alternatives and if you don't know what the hotel brands are doing that's going to be really hard so marketers need to communicate and they need to address perceptions right they have to win the customer trust back 
that's very important. When barriers go down and they will come down and people are allowed to travel again, you can see a lot of our industry is reacting really fast. This is a really, really good and encouraging message to see that they're doing, they're working a lot, very hard now uh, through the pandemic. So when things, uh, things go back to, uh, let, I'm not gonna say normal, but when things uh, come back to a situation where everybody can travel again, domestically and overseas, uh, it's important, again, to reassure, to uh, provide guests with the confidence that they can stay at my hotel. It's clean, it's secure, we have technology, we're gonna cater for him. One way that they can do that is to promise to clean like a hospital. What does that mean? Um, it means today, the, perhaps the, the specific points or specific places around the world that have the highest standards of cleanliness are hospitals. So hospitals for, for pretty much since the beginning of time, hospitals have always primed for their high degrees of cleanliness. And they have to because they are dealing with viruses, infections, uh, microbes, and all that stuff. So that has been the standard. And this standard now, as we can see, is being adopted by the hotel industry. So as I said, cleanliness and hygiene will be the new five-star restaurant or the new five-star hotel, right? So we're gonna be checking reviews. We're gonna be talking to friends. Did you stay at the, that hotel? Oh, is it clean? Uh, do they have a program? How is that program? Uh, customers will talk to each other. And if you're, as a marketer, if you're not communicating that clearly uh, through social, through testimonials, through content marketing, it'll be very hard to gain that trust, right? Uh, so sharing all of these things. And also ultimately, when we think about, uh, we, you know, in the beginning of the presentation, I was talking a little bit about, um, just talking a little bit about uh, disruptors, right? So today we can see that, um, hotels might have an advantage over home sharing, right? I'm saying might because nothing stops Airbnb from implementing their own uh, programs, right? But the challenge for Airbnb will be, uh, how can they actually execute this? Because they don't own the properties. They don't own, uh, they don't have, you know, the, the, the owners of the, ho the houses that are renting through the Airbnb are not employees. So how do you ensure consistency? So this is a critical factor. This is really, really key, where I believe, and a lot of people in the industry believe that hotels will have a compelling advantage because they have, uh, they have that ability to ensure consistency, right? Uh, if you go to a, a five-star hotel in Manila, in Jakarta, in Sydney, and if it's part of a Grand Hyatt, and you've read about this, and you've seen about these new campaigns, you will feel more at ease of staying in that hotel because you know what they're doing. Whereas with an Airbnb, you're thinking, okay, can I really trust that that person actually used the same standards of cleaning? That's a very good point, you know? Also, when we think about hotels having the advantage over home sharing, you know, they have staff, as I was saying, and they'll have the training programs, but not only that, they have um, you know, most of them have marketing budgets that allow them to promote this. So all your hard work as a hotel needs to be promoted. People need to know, right? So this is really important. We need the customer back, trust back, but also promoting this through campaigns. So now when we think about marketing, this, this is something that hasn't changed. When we think about the consumer buying process, this structure hasn't necessarily changed. What changed is the kind of problems that consumers have, right? So let's think about a typical decision-making process, right? Problem recognition, I have a problem. You know, I'm going to travel, I need a place to stay, right? That is the problem. I have a need for accommodation, right? Then you start doing information search. In this particular point in time, as a consumer, I would be looking at hotels that offer those standards, right? So. Whilst I'm doing my information search through Google, through reviews, TripAdvisor, so forth and so on, I would be looking as a guest at those things. And then if I have maybe two or three options, I would evaluate. So I'm looking at Grand Hyatt. Grand Hyatt launched a massive program, which is all about safety and hygiene. Okay, this is good. Then I'm looking at Hilton. Hilton also does it. 
And then I look at Formula One. Uh, Formula One is part of a core group. It's a cheaper hotel. And they also do that. Uh, there's a problem. I can't afford to stay at Grand Hyatt. I need to go to a more affordable brand, right? So when evaluating these alternatives, I've looked at three different hotels. They're different in the way that they are, what's the, the, the sort of value proposition that they are offering. And when I look at Formula One, which is a more of an affordable brand, and when I know that they offer uh, the same high levels because they're part of a core group, that's fantastic. You know, so I, my problem I have identified, I started searching, I evaluated my particular need is for an affordable accommodation. They tick the boxes and then I think about my purchase decision. And then the post, pay, the post purchase behavior is really important as well because for us marketers and companies, we need people to then uh, promote us and say good things about us through referrals, so if you look at TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor is a fantastic platform for the tourism and travel industry. So much positive feedback, so much negative feedback as well, which is a good thing because then you can evaluate your options, right? And in this particular point in time, it's all about safety. It's all about feeling reassured and you're gonna go with, guests are gonna go, especially now when things reopen, they will want to go with what is safe and they're gonna read the reviews, right? So that's really important to nurture that guest all the way, all the way to the point of the post purchase, right? Just to quickly show you, uh, you might be familiar with this model. This is uh, in marketing. This is something we're always trying trying to look at. You know, uh, from physiological needs to safety, all the way up to self actualization. At this particular point in time, I would stress that it, uh, the safety needs will be something that every single marketing working in hotel management, hospitality, tourism, travel, they will need to focus heavily on reassuring customers that their safety needs will be met with our hotel brand. If they're not doing that, if they're not communicating that, it'll be very hard. It's not gonna be impossible, but if your competitor is doing that, it'll be really challenging. Just wanted to share quickly with you needs versus wants. So we have, a very clear picture. So we have needs. Needs are something that are very necessary, right? So I'll give you an example. I'm hungry, I need food, but a want is very specific. I want a hamburger. Let's think about the customer today. I am tired, I need a place to rest. I want a clean environment and safe environment. So we cannot, I cannot stress this enough. Marketers, they can't just think about needs. They need to think also about wants. Consumers are highly informed. Consumers are connected to the web. They have Google, they have uh, TripAdvisor, they have friends, you know, they have mobile phones. They can check information at any time. So it's imperative that we as marketers, when looking at the new normal, we look at once because consumers will voice their opinions. And if we're not offering that, they will go to the competition. And if the competition is offering that, we will lose business. So I just wanted to share this. This is really important in when thinking about marketing and not only marketing, thinking about the consumer, right? Just to highlight, just to give you a bit of a definition here about marketing. So what I like about this definition here, I even highlighted this in blue. It's the activity, right? It's every single thing we do from new campaigns through new programs like Grand Hyatt with the the, the, the health and safety one, the clean, cleanliness program, it's all about value, okay? The idea of value has changed, right? What does, the, what does value mean today for consumers? So today for travelers, value is not necessarily staying in a five-star hotel, which is just luxurious, right? Value today is knowing that you can go to that luxurious hotel and you're not gonna get sick. And that the, 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 the hotel brand behind that operation is doing every single thing they need to ensure that your experience is going to be remarkable. What do I mean by that? You'll have positive memories, right? But not only that, you're not going to get sick, right? So this is so important. And that's why I really like this definition. And I highlighted value because really this, this is something we're all experiencing. What does value mean? It has different meanings to different people, but now more so than ever, 
value has a different uh, meaning and value now is ensuring safety of guests. If you can do that as a hotel, you're doing the right thing. And marketing again needs to ensure it's communicating that value proposition very clearly. The marketing mix, just briefly, one I wanted to share here is that when we're looking at hotels, we look at, we, we all know the four Ps, but when we look at services and hotels and tourism is a service, we have the augmented marketing mix, which also includes, in addition to product price, place, and promotion, it includes people. So all the initiatives we saw before from Grand Hyatt, it involves people. Process, the way they do things, right? Technology, in, the, in, in how people make reservations and how people interact with staff. Process is ticked by Grand Hyatt and is being ticked by the other hotel brands. How they communicate with guests, how they are able to solve problems in a contactless environment and situation and physical evidence. Because it's a service and services are perishable because you can't take a service home, you experience the service physical evidence. So going into a room, seeing a label, right? A stamp that says this room is virus free. This room here has the seal of quality. That is physical evidence. You can see it and that makes you feel more relaxed. So the marketing mix is not going to change, but how we apply the marketing mix is what's going to be very, very, it's imperative that marketers look at this marketing mix, they revisit this marketing mix in hotels and in tourism and in airlines, and they have to focus on how they go about these things. This is really important and I can't stress enough because the old way of using the marketing mix, that's going to change, right? The, the foundation doesn't change, but how we apply the tools changes. Wanted to talk to you about segmentation. Segmentation is also really important in marketing for hotels. And now with this whole situation with the pandemic, uh, they have to segment their offers, right? How are they gonna position their products? How are they going to uh, look at the market? You're gonna, you certainly will have people that are going to be their extremely picky customers they're gonna be labeled as the health, the extremely health conscious, right? So there is a market for these people and these people, they're gonna be looking, right? You can't treat every single customer the same, right? So this is a classic, um, this is a classic uh, saying by Henry Ford who founded Ford Motors. And it's really interesting because it shows us how marketing was around a hundred years ago more than 100 years ago, and what marketing is today. So Henry Ford was famous for saying that any customer could have a car painted any color, and he was being funny here, so as long as it's black. So this was in 1909. So they could have any car, any color, so as long as it was the, uh, the Ford Motor T and black. However, would Ford have grown and survived if they had only Ford Motor, uh, the Model T and black? too often? Is that all that consumers wanted? Were all customers the same? Did they all have the same needs? So we look at Ford today, Ford 2020, and we can see that there are different kinds of cars. It's not just black, even though the first car to the left is a black car, the Ford Focus, but you have uh, cars that are uh, at an entry level price point, which is the case of the, of the Ford Focus. You have a muscle car, also known as a sports car, which is the Mustang, which is a, an icon, right? It's a, it's a very fast car. It's for individuals who have a different uh, way to see life. They like adventure, they're thrill seekers. So we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, psychographic segmentation. You also have the Everest. Uh, the Everest is, is a, an SUV, right? It's a car for the family. So the question here is whoever buys the Everest, would that person also buy uh, a Mustang? That's the question. So Ford understands the market, right? Same thing with the Ranger. The Ranger is a big sized car, but it has a, an open back. And how you use that particular car is different from how you would use the Everest. They're both big cars, right? But there are differences there. So 2020, different models, different colors, different sizes, different prices. And I, may I add different uses. And when we look into segmentation, just a quick definition here for you, it's the way that we divide the markets. And when we're segmenting, 
whether we're going to run a campaign, whether we're going to come up with a new product, we need to understand how consumers think, what's important to them, so forth and so on. And we're going to group those customers based on commonalities, right? We could use uh, a series of bases, right? So what we can see here, and hotels are looking at this very much, we started from, a, from the left, uh, it's a continuum, right? So from a very, very unspecific and undifferentiated offer, which is the case of the Ford T, black Ford T, that's all you get. That's mess. Everybody gets the same. It's the one fits all, one size fits all approach, excuse me. And then you evolve to differentiated, concentrated, which is a niche. And then finally, which is something that is being used a lot these days, it's micro marketing, which means focusing in segments of one. What is, we can look at demographics, we can look at psychographics, but let's not forget that people are individuals, right? If they have the means to pay for a service, if they have the, the financials, the means, uh, it, we need, hotels need to be able to accommodate and they need to be flexible to offer things that are customized. That's another important word, uh, personalization, and customization. When we think about segmentation, the more we personalize an offering, the more we personalize and customize an offering, the chances are the higher the return we're gonna get on that specific uh, guest or if we're selling a product, the same thing. And here, just to show you something really interesting is just a different segmentation basis. So geographics, country, city, density, language, climate, area, population, demographics, age, gender, income, education, occupation, psychographics brings a lot of this to life because you're not just looking at age and gender uh, as part or income as part of that equation. What you're looking here is you're digging deep into the customer and you are understanding their lifestyle, their needs, their values, their personality, their attitudes. So you might be able to, let's say, segment the market from, let's say an example, all the students in Jakarta, their age is from 18 to 24, male, female. But if you're, if you're thinking, if you're a whole, into the hotel industry, what is their lifestyle? Because you could be targeting people that are from that same age and those genders, but they don't like to travel. So lifestyle is understanding that extra layer, because when you're targeting, you will be affected right? And also behavior. How are they going to use the service? How are they going to purchase the service, right? Uh, at what stage of the buying process are these buyers? So you can look at all these people, group them, but don't forget to look at psychographics. Don't forget to understand, because when you're thinking about communication, you could really offend someone, right? You could offend someone because you don't understand their attitudes or values, their concerns. Uh, so it's really important. So segmentation, I cannot stress enough how important this is. Now let's look at segmentation for hotels. So, so how are some of the ways that hotels can segment their customer base? This is really important. They can look at reasons for traveling. Why do people travel? Some people travel for business purposes. Some people travel because they, they wanna go on a vacation, right? Other people, like in Australia, it's very common for people to go on a gap year. So that's a reason for traveling, right? Some people travel domestically, some people travel internationally, right? Budget sensitivity, so the segmentation base you would look on here is segmenting by price, right? Length of stay, how long are they staying in the hotel? Is it for a weekend, one day, uh, just for one night? Are they gonna stay a month because they're going on a, a trip to Disneyland or they're going to a resort, right? Um, how much is this customer willing to spend? Very important. There is a department in every hotel called the revenue management department. And what they do is they look at occupation rates and they look at uh, what is, how much money can I get from a, a room, right? So their whole role is to maximize the return on that specific room. That is really, really important. So then, when we think about spend per customer, if you know you have your VIPs and your VIPs tend to spend, let's say $150 as per the example, are you gonna treat them the same or are you gonna communicate with them the same way you communicate with the lower tier customers? 
respect, quality, safety, that's, that's non-negotiable. Everybody has to be treated with respect, with safety. But how do you communicate? What do you offer? What is the value add that you offer VIPs? That's where segmentation comes in. Uh, are they midweek or weekend travelers? Very important because we know rates go up in the weekend, right? And during hotels, what happens, normally occupation rates go down during the week. So hotels have to find creative ways to attract public during the week, promotions and things like that. The lead time is important. How soon are they booking? Cancellation requirements. So this is another point where Airbnb, where we were speaking in the beginning, this is where Airbnb actually uh, went wrong because their cancellation requirements were really, really strict. And a lot of unhappy customers went on to, to dispute Airbnb. Whereas hotels have more flexibility in their terms and their agreements, this is another area where moving forward, the new normal has to be flexibility. You know, If people change their mind, they have to be able to, to cancel and not be penalized. And yes, they, if, if, if need be, receive their money back, be reimbursed food and beverage requirements and amenities requirements. So the last point here is a critical one because now every single guest will be looking at uh, safety and hygiene as an amenity. That's going to be very important. So just to give you an idea and this little uh, diagram at the bottom will show you that if you look at all customers the same way, you will have uh, your, your, the, the amount of money you can make from that operation is significantly reduced because you're treating VIP customers uh, the same way you're treating low tiers. Uh, low tiers don't, sometimes don't value what you offer to VIP customers because it's not what they're looking for. They have a much more uh, basic need when compared to VIPs. So that's really important. Here, an example related to the hotel industry, right? So this is a car, and this is a course portfolio. A car is perhaps one of the largest hotel groups in the world today. And this is a fantastic way that they segment. They, they go from their luxury brands all the way to economy. So a clear segmentation base that they're using here is demographics. They're looking at price affordability, but they're also looking at uh, psychographics and usage. So luxury. When we think about luxury, we think about people, how they want to be perceived. You know, the premium guests, the luxury guests, it's not just about staying at a hotel. It's the statement they make. Look, I'm going to travel to Tokyo and I'm going to stay at uh, the Raffles Hotel. There's a, co a prestigious conference and I'm staying at the Raffles. So that has a lot to say about the person, right? So there is a a, if you go back to the Maslow's pyramid of, and hierarchy of needs, it's need of self-actualization. It's no longer a basic need. It's the need of self-actualization, of being perceived a social need as well, which is a higher level of need. Whereas if you look at the hotel Formula One, it's a great hotel, but it doesn't have the same perks. It doesn't have the same sophistication uh, as uh, the Raffles Hotel but you still have a place where you can rest, where you can spend the night. It's still safe. It still has the uh, hygiene measures, but it's just simpler. It's stripped back. It's almost like if you think about the airline company, if you think about in Australia, there's Qantas. Qantas has, you know, the whole uh, loyalty card, VIP, the uh, business class, first class, whereas Jetstar is the low fare, right? Different products, for different needs, segmentation is really, really key. And at the bottom, you see uh, work and play. So play is more focused on leisure. Work is about the business traveler. Again, segmentation here, behavioral and usage. What is the use? Why do they need to stay here? They need a conference. They need to host an event. That's very important. We go into brand now because brand is a very important aspect of a marketing function, as we can see. It's all about the brand. It's all about how the brand is positioning itself in this moment of crises, how well they're communicating, how compassionate they can be, and how quickly they can be. Again, quick definition. There's a difference between brand and branding. Don't make, a, don't make the mistake of confusing brand with branding. Brand is the sum of expressions. 
It's, it can be, you know, people can be brands, celebrities can be brands. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim Rudling delivers an amazing uh, brand personality, uh, personal brands uh, webinar. And uh, I learned this with Tim. It's all about, you know, the sum of expressions, person, organization, company, business, politicians, you name it. Uh, you can brand virtually anything. And branding, on the other hand, is everything the entity or the marketing department does with the intention, the unique intention of making this brand recognized. We can think about Nike, for example, just to, just to show you a different example out of the hotel industry. Nike is instantly recognized. As soon as you see the little tick, the swoosh, you associate it with Nike. It, excuse me, if you see Roger Federer playing, who's a tennis player, or Tiger Woods, or in my case, I love basketball, Michael Jordan, you will associate those individuals, those personal brands with Nike. And the series of associations, if you look at Tiger Woods, highly successful, highly victorious, won so many uh, titles in, in golf. He's perhaps the best golf player who ever walked the planet. You have a tennis player like... Um, uh, Rafael Nadal and, uh, and the Federer, they're both amazing. And then you start noticing, okay, so Nike only associates itself with winners with the best. Oh, maybe Nike is the best. And that's how you, you get branding and you, take, and you bring it to life. These associations are really important, which is the example we saw with Grant Hyatt. Grant Hyatt teaming up with um, John Hopkins. John Hopkins University, which is the, the best, one of the best, if not the best medical school around the world. So that's a so power by association. I just wanted to share this with you because I think this is important. When we think about the brand, the manifesto, what does the brand stand for? Very important. So a core, I'm gonna read it to you because it, it, it is exciting to, to see this. This is all about hospitality and hotel management. So what is a CARS manifesto? The art of hospitality knows no bounds. This means there are no limits. It extends beyond walls. So they can see it's more than just the physical space. To spark inspired experiences everywhere. We dare to reimagine hospitality. So look at this, they're reimagining. And now this is perfect. For this particular point in time to have this particular brand message is just amazing not as a place or service, but infinite connected moments. So it's about moments, connectivity, whether you want to live, work, or play. So here we can see segmentation. If you want, you can stay with us because we offer solutions. We offer uh, accommodation for people who want to simply live, people who are in business who want to work, or people who want to go on a vacation. So they have, so segmentation being used in the brand manifesto. We are shaping a future where travel unlocks a life lived limitless. Again, no limits. And I want to highlight this point where powerful brands deliver exception, sorry, exceptional experiences and value. Do you remember that definition by on marketing? It's all about value. So here we go. Powerful brands deliver not ordinary average. It's exceptional uh, experiences and value. And talent and passion deliver a welcoming human touch. So here, it's really important. We're dealing with people. Our employees are not, uh, our, our employees in the case of a car are not robots. So that's really important. Where innovation constantly expands boundaries. So innovation, these brands, these hotel brands are using technology and they're gonna have to start using more and more technology. Now, given the whole COVID situation and the aftermath, uh, and commitment to sustainability. So again, very important. Thinking about the environment, thinking about sustainability. At the hotel school, we have a fantastic unit, which is all about sustainability because this has become one of the most important items on the agendas of CEOs for these big uh, hotel brands. So sustainability, not destroying the planet. You know, especially now with all the chemicals being used, are these chemicals going to be environmentally friendly? We have seen through these examples today that yes, they tick that box. So that's very important. To one planet, we have only one planet, but we have many communities. 
because the future belongs to those who design it. And we're here to bring you there first. So it's an amazing brand manifesto. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing because this, again, this career, if you decide to study, to study this career, to, to, to follow this career, it is a beautiful career. It's all about creating these memorable experiences, it's dealing with human beings. It's, I can't say how excited, how passionate I am to work with hotel management education because we clearly see so many of our students thriving and becoming leaders and they tr go on to transform the lives of other people, which is simply amazing. This is the whole, uh, the Accor, sorry, this is the Accor website. As you can see, they're highly brand oriented. They can, they segment their brands through, again, using a clear segmentation, uh, luxury premium mid scale. You can, the look and feel of this, uh, this website is simply amazing. They use purple. Purple is a royal color. Kings and queens used to use, used to wear purple back in the day. So gold and purple are the, are the, the signs. And their, and their brand uses this. Their brand guidelines states that purple and gold are the sign, the signs of royalty, because we want people to feel special when they come to our uh, hotels. Content. We're getting close to the end, guys. Just wanted to talk to you a little bit about content because content is how exactly we are going to communicate and convey these messages. So this is the arsenal that marketers have today. Uh, from blog posts to social media posts to webinars, video content, infographic podcasts, you name it. This is a toolkit. This is your uh, toolkit. If you're going to work in marketing, in communications, this is, this is the, the present and the future. More so now because we, like today, today is only possible because this is a webinar, right? Somehow we're using technology to get the message across. So very important to, to bear these tools in mind. And when we look at webinars, you know, today is, a, is, a, is, is just a, cre a critical example of how important it is. You know, in self-isolation, I'm here in Australia, I'm speaking to you guys over in Jakarta, we're all on the same uh, page, we're exchanging thoughts and ideas today, which is just fantastic. So webinars, you know, uh, very important tool and now more so than before. Infographics, so this is an example from the World Health Organization. The beauty of uh, infographics is it is able to consolidate a large number of information in a more simple and streamlined way. So you can rest assured that not just the World Health Organization, but five-star hotels, hotels in general will start if they haven't done so already, they are going to, to need to use a lot of this um, kind of uh, collateral because this really, really uh, just simplifies through visual means how, you know, what the message they, they want to uh, get across. Instead of writing a massive blog post, they use info, infographics. So for simple and things that, are, that need to be understood quite quickly, infographics are perfect. I wanted to highlight this because I thought this was a very creative use of blog posts. This is by Lonely Planet. Lonely Planet is uh, that company, that publishing company focused on the tourism and hotels and traveling. The reason I think this is creative is it's very, very much aligned to their brand proposition. They're all about traveling. They're all about uh, vacations. And I thought that this was simply genius the way that they used uh, a, a blog post to somehow get people that they know read their blogs but people that are still in that mindset of traveling so they're talking to the traveler here this from a psychographic perspective they're speaking to travelers being in social isolation doesn't stop us dreaming of all the places we'd like to visit in fact now we've got even more time to daydream Escape on a virtual vacation to bring a little piece of Thailand to your living room. This is simply five-star uh, blog writing, use of good content, topical, highly aligned, aligned to the moment, highly aligned to the industry and to the brand. And they're talking to people who love to travel because Lonely Planet is all about giving the best advice to people who want to travel. So 
brilliant, brilliant piece of content. This is another fantastic example because we know we are in social isolation and Lonely Planet did their homework. This home decor will transport you to the destinations of your dreams. By now, you've taken the virtual tours and the online classes, sorted through the souvenirs and tapped into the tips of and the tips to keep your love of travel alive. So just look at how beautifully this copy is written. They know people can travel, but they're talking to that traveler who lives in the heart of every single person who likes to travel. So understanding the love to travel, but you can also set up your home based to transport you elsewhere. So your home, right, through this can take you places, right? So they do understand the, the psychology behind things with decor that reminds you of places you've been or bucket list destinations you've yet to visit. Here are a handful of ideas to put you in a far off state of mind. Amazing, brilliant. I, uh, this to me is, 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 is a fantastic standard of writing and using blogs creatively in, in an engaging way. Social media. So this here uh, is specifically on Four Seasons uh, in Sydney. And just wanted to highlight that we're going through a difficult moment, but that doesn't mean that social media needs to be all catastrophic, doom and gloom. No, it doesn't. You can touch upon, you, you, you can use a tone of voice that is appropriate to the moment and also communicate your fine dining experiences that you can get through Four Seasons. So been dreaming of the wood roasted glacier 51 toothfish, which is this plate. Us too. Today we are excited to open our doors once again and create memorable dining experiences for you. Uh, this weekend our chefs will be preparing a reduced menu of entrees, main, entrees, mains, and dessert, but in due course we will build back to a full menu. Per the directive, directives of the Australian government, Mold Kitchen will host a maximum of 10 guests at a time whilst practicing social distancing and COVID safe procedures. So again, you are, you are uh, communicating the importance of social distancing. You're telling people and guests to feel free and safe to come to your restroom, to your restaurant, sorry. And you're using a magnificent photograph. And your copy talks about everything it needs to talk about without being catastrophic. And this is perfectly aligned to the Four Seasons brand. It's just beautiful social media. Another example, and this one here, you can see from the date, May 22nd. So this was what, last week? Let us lead you back with the utmost care. As we look ahead to the future of hospitality and travel, we have embarked on an important collaboration with John Hopkins Medicine International to validate Lead with Care, which is the program I shared with you today in the first section. Our enhanced global health and safety program focused on providing care. Uh, so as you can see, using uh, the copy in a very smart manner, a photo that shows the app, which is critical at this point in time. And again, really amazing social media and a great post. Another fantastic uh, social media post by Four Seasons, work from hotel and social distance in style with iconic views of Sydney. So again, they can talk about social distancing, they can talk about the situation, in a very, and look, he's relaxed, he's looking at his mobile phone, beautiful photo of the uh, opera house. This is really smart social media. This is just using the right copy, the right words, understanding what the brand stands for, and aligning these things to deliver a fantastic post. Because it shows Four Seasons, they're on top of their game, but they're not trying to scare anybody because that's not required. They're doing a lot of, a lot of hard work in the back, and they're still being very, very reasonable and creative in the way they deliver messages. Okay, we're coming towards the end now. In summary, what I would like you guys to take away from this uh, opportunity today is the COVID-19 pandemic is a global phenomenon. It is causing an unprecedented degree of impact to all. We know this, but we can also see that the industry is doing a lot. And I can guarantee to you that this industry, this industry, let me just say a few words about this industry. This industry is an industry uh, that was built upon the values of resilience, hard work, uh, problem solving, 
creativity, and excellence in, in servicing guests. So trust me when I say, because they have these uh, traits and these values, rest assured, uh, we're, when we look back at this presentation, we'll say this was a bump in the road, right? Just like when 9-11 hit the United States, people in New York were really concerned. Are people going to come? Are, you know, are, should we worry about tourists not traveling to New York? And we can see that New York not only overcame that situation, but today New York is still a, a tourist hub, right? When you go to the US, you go to New York City. So the same thing applies to this industry. People will still want to travel. People will still need to stay in hotels. That is not going to change, right? However, what needs to change is the mindset. As marketers, as hospitality students, business students, hotel management students, we need to change our, our mindsets. We need to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions, such as the ones we've seen today by some of the big hotel uh, global brands. The means, this means that traditional ways of doing business are now becoming obsolete. We, we have to rethink these things, right? Marketers need to manage guest and customer perception. This is really important. The latest uh, examples I shared with you, the way Grand Hyatt is using social media, the way Lonely Planet is communicating through their blogs, and the whole programs around self, uh, health and safety, the PR they're generating, the commitment sh being shown by the CEOs is simply amazing. Marketers need to rethink the way their brands and products and services engage and interact. Technology is going to play a massive role in this. It's already playing. We can see chats, apps, uh, very important to highlight this. Social distancing, hygiene, and refund policies. I'm gonna put May because we're still living the process, but I rest assured this is going to be the game changer for all, us, all of us in this industry. And I love this one here. The contactless hotel stay may be considered the new luxury, the new five stars. And uh, a very, very important insight to take into account when designing you know, new services, when designing new products, so forth and so on. And finally, cleanliness and hygiene will be the new five-star restaurant or the new five-star hotel. Again, this I cannot stress enough. When we look back, I really, I really liked, I thought that the, the topic for this pre presentation was a really, really good topic because it's, it's pretty clear to me and it's clear, I hope it has become clear to all of us today that we can't simply repeat the past, expecting to achieve success. So we have to learn from these mistakes and we have to change. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, it's been an honor. It's been uh, fantastic to be here with you. Again, Agustina, uh, Super Sashinka, Citra, Zarin, Donnie, Tim, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was amazing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fernando, uh, for amazing presentation and setting information for all of us. And we will go ahead, uh, take some time for question now. Uh, Ms. Darin will be assist you for the Q&A session. Yes, okay. Ms. Yes. Darin, please. Okay, yes. Good afternoon, uh, Fernando. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Can you hear my voice? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. That is a very great presentation. So we have a lot of questions from our from our audiences, mm -hmm. uh, around 15 questions last, last yeah. time I count, and I think it kept coming. <laughs> so I will read the first two questions according to the timelines. Uh, is that okay for you? Yes, yeah, that's fine, that's perfect. Okay, so the first question is from Julius Hari Widodo. Uh, he's from Polytechnic Negeri Madiun. Uh, he, her, his, his question is, seems that people will be a little bit paranoid to travel, to go around tourism objects, to stay in a hotel, and etc. Et so what should we do to convince them that it is okay? That is his, uh, the first question. The second okay. is from Gary Nugroho. Uh, he is one of our students. So I find the Airbnb example is a good case study based on Airbnb case, in your opinion. 
Will this kind of situation make people afraid to enter the tourism industry as an entrepreneur? For example, to open a new accommodation uh, or travel agencies. Because tourism is a fragile industry and without enough capital, they will not survive when they have to compete with a bigger uh, rival, such as hotel groups, or even when they're facing pandemics. Okay, and the third question is uh, from Mr. Rahmadi Parmono. He is the head of uh, business school in our university at Majaya. Should, guess, should guests at the, a hotel have to qualify their help first before being staying? Or what about traveler who habitually move around? Okay, that's the first two questions. Uh, perhaps you could answer their question first. That's that's fine. Can I kindly ask you to repeat the first question again, please? Okay. The first question is: uh, So, what should we do to convince the uh, people uh, uh, to travel uh, again? Okay. 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 So this is a, this is this is the million dollar question, and it's and this is an excellent question. Um, I think, and based on what uh, I spoke today in the presentation we look at consumers and as marketers as business leaders it is imperative to understand consumer perceptions okay so th th this this is important and we can't just simply start doing things without proper thinking and without a purpose so the first point that i would say to answer this question is understand your customer right it's very important because as we know, there are groups of people that will be more susceptible to everything that is happening. And, and then we need to segment these, these individuals and understand their behaviors and their attitudes. What do I mean by this? There will be, if you, if you take the market, the whole of the market, right? And you think, okay, I'm gonna com communicate using one single way and one single message to get everybody in that market. I can guarantee that that communication strategy, that marketing strategy will not be successful. Why? Because in that group of consumers, if you look at all the consumers, you'll have people that are in, in, in a graph, they will be more concerned and there will be people that will be less concerned, right? Also, you will have people that have a degree to be more fearful of, of situations, right? So what I would say is first and foremost, very important, understand who your customers are understand their mindset, understand what makes them tick, what is on their mind. And market research is going to be really, really important because once you understand uh, what they're thinking, uh, what is preventing them from making this decision, uh, it's going to be much easier to, in a second step, think about the communication, right? So. You, if you have identified that a group of your customers are not so worried about this and they're more willing to travel, why? Because they've had enough of staying home and they're looking forward toward a vacation. You can still communicate that you have a safe environment and that you're doing everything within your reach as a hotel to tick boxes as far as safety and hygiene are concerned in given the COVID situation. So that's a, 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 you will tailor the message differently for those people. Now, for those people where they're more concerned, more worried, then you have to really run a focus group perhaps and see what are their perceptions of, of what's happening and have your marketing team ready to then from, from this particular uh, focus group, uh, brainstorm solutions, brainstorm, listen to the terminology that the consumers are using, listen to how they respond to certain prompts that are being posed and this will help the marketing team to then come up with a refined and tailored strategy to use the right words, the right content to that specific group. So what I'm advocating here is segmentation, not treating everybody the same. Uh, it's also uh, understanding the different uh, mindsets of these consumers, right? As I said, you have consumers who just want to travel and when, once it's over, it's over and they're going to hop on the first plane and they're going to go. We know we have consumers like that. But on the other hand, you have other consumers that they're not going to leave home. So it's one extreme here and the other extreme here and then trying to understand how can we better communicate with them. And then with this particular group, have more of a personalized approach. This is important. So the message has to be tailored. 
you might involve your sales team to, to have a, a phone conversation with these, with these guests, if they are VIP guests, for example, in that situation, if they're business guests, right? Companies. Uh, so this is my advice. So this is what I believe would help convince by looking at them through a segmented approach and also understanding the mindset, the perception, uh, what's making them awake, stay awake at night. And from there, you come up with your communication and uh, that will ensure success in the strategy. So you, different communication points to different people is what I would say to convince them. Okay, so the, is, is that okay? okay? Okay, so the second question is around Airbnb. Uh, and it's a very good question. Uh, when we look at the hotel and accommodation industry, it is important to take a step back and think about the industry, right? And there's a very interesting model by an individual called Michael Porter. Michael Porter came up with a framework that is called the five, for, the five forces model, okay? It looks at a series of different forces that impact an industry. The beauty of this model is it is transferable to any industry. So you can use it for education, for energy, for accommodation, doesn't matter because it's a framework, okay? So what is the premise of this framework? First and foremost, it looks at the different five forces that impact an industry. It looks at, uh, and for this particular example, and thank you for the question, uh, I would like to highlight the force related to threat of new entrants. So how high are the barriers to entry, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this question in, different, in, in two different stages. The first one, before Airbnb came to play in, in the industry, we had uh, what was called a, it was called a, uh, just the hospitality and hotel industry, okay? What happened in 2008 was a massive disruption, okay? There is a strategy that is being used a lot by companies around the world. It's called blue ocean strategy. What does that mean? It means that you're going to target a specific industry, but you're not going to replicate the same uh, steps or the same measures used by the conventional players in that industry. So what Airbnb did in order to enter this market, because if we only looked at the, the, the hotel management industry, I would rate it as having a high, uh, high barriers to entry. Why? Because it's high, the capital required to enter this is high. Why? You need to build hotels, you need to have computers for your booking service. You have to hire employees. So it is a highly uh, capital intensive industry. For that point alone, I would say it would be nearly impossible for new entrants to, to enter. However, and the case with Airbnb in hosp hospitality and hotel management and with Uber in the taxi industry, which is a very similar kind of strategy, what these two companies did, they disrupted the industry by creating a new way of uh, entering the industry. So if in the past you relied, for example, if taxis in the past relied on having a huge fleet of cars to be successful and enter, because that's what a taxi company needs, what did Uber do? Uber simply ignored that and said, hmm, why not enter this industry Perhaps they are the world's largest fleet. They have the, the world's largest fleet without owning a single car. And the same case applies to Airbnb. And yet, through creativity, lateral thinking, and the application of Blue Ocean strategy, they were, all, they were able to enter this market. And that's why it's called a disruption. So to answer your question, uh, new companies, should they be afraid to enter the market? Or should they be concerned? I would say, they shouldn't be. And a lesson that can be learned through Airbnb now is Airbnb tried to get the whole market. But what could be a potential solution for Airbnb in the short term is niche segmentation. So instead of getting all the, the, the homes around the world, segment your market. 
And once you segment your market, you're able to control, and it's going to be imperative for Airbnb to do this. Why? Because the hotels have an advantage. They have staff, they have the human resources team, they have the marketing team, all working towards the same objective, right? Because they're under the same company and they're being paid by the same institution. With Airbnb, you have people from all different walks of life. You have people who clean their houses five days a week. You have people who don't care about keeping their houses clean. You have people who, you know, um, uh, they just rent their property. It's their second property and they put it up on Airbnb. They rarely go to that property. So through segmentation to, let's say, maybe diminishing the size of that market and just being more clear on their way they tackle that, that market, they could be successful. And that is potentially an idea for new entrants, you know, to use perhaps the same strategy as Airbnb to keep your, your costs down as much as possible, but with the added advantage of instead of biting this whole pie, this whole market, which is hard given the, the, the challenges we just spoke about, just keeping it simple and smaller. This way you ensure your, your uh, hygiene practices, your programs, uh, the people when selecting uh, new partners, they have to go through an extensive interview, for example. You're only going to become a partner for uh, the new Airbnb if you follow this, this, and this. And if you have this, 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 and kind of property. If they match this criteria, they're on board. If not, then. So this is a way that I see that they can still enter the market, yet do it in a more uh, staged approach. Does that answer the question? I think, I think, is, I think that's what... Uh, the question was all around, right? So, so if they're afraid to enter the industry, this could be a way to, to give them the confidence to enter the market and not do the same mistakes that Airbnb did, for example. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, answered the question enough. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just, uh, I'm sorry, what was the third question again? Um, the third question is from Mr. Ahmadi Parmono. Mm -hmm. uh, should guests at the hotel have to qualify their help first before staying? Uh, and what about the travelers who, had, who habitually move around? So should they qualify their help first before checking in a hotel? So if they should, ah, okay. So sh should they qualify their health before going to the, to the, to stay at a hotel? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. That's, that's the question. That is a great question. Um, so if hotels should ask guests to do that, or if, or if just people should do it by themselves? I think the question is more like, is there any procedure in the hotel that the guests should do before check-in? Okay, cool. Okay, fantastic question. <laughs> I would say yes. You know, I think at this particular point in time, and we've seen in the news, a lot of hotels are, uh, or, and, and even moving forward, uh, what they'll do is they'll, they'll have to scan. This is probably a smart thing to do. They'll have to scan uh, guests in, in, and do it in a way which is not going to make people feel uncomfortable, right? Because we're dealing with people and the last thing you want is to be, let's say, hey, can you come to this line, please? You know? So what they can do is they can do a triage system. They can monitor people's temperature because that's exactly what governments around the world are doing you know, in a very respectful may, way, thinking about a person, there's a person there, so you have to have empathy with the person. So what I would say, yes, that could be a potential avenue for them to, to, to uh, at least understand what sort of people are coming in. If a person is identified with a fever, then what the, the, the next step in the triage process could be a questionnaire, a quick survey, which is exactly what a lot of uh, health institutions are doing here in Australia and some places around the world have implemented, which is a fantastic way to do that because if they feel like a person is, let's say, at risk, they could at least isolate that person, right? Uh, and, and manage that situation in, in, in a positive light because I think the last, pe the last thing people want now or the last thing hotel brands want to do is to alienate or discriminate. So this is a way of doing it in such a way where they feel at ease and they don't feel discriminated because it could be really, really, if let's say if I were in line and people came with a thermometer, hey, come this way, I would feel, I wouldn't feel good. But if they do it in a way, maybe they can send that via SMS first, do that questionnaire uh, through the mobile phone. That's an easier way to do it. Uh, you know, and if, if they tick the boxes for many things, that could be a way of at least screening 
the kind of people that are coming to the hotel. That's, that's one way to do it uh, without being too intrusive, right? So it's a great question. And I think a lot of the hotels are incorporating this procedure in the way they're going to do They have to do that. You know, they have to incorporate this somehow uh, to ensure the um, integrity, you know, the physical and well-being of their guests. Yeah, uh, that is, I think that's answered the question. Also, actually, there's another question from Muhyiddin Aziz. Uh, I think it's the same question about what is the standard way to select the guests of the hotel before checking in to make sure that he or she is not confirmed COVID-19. I think you already answered the question. Yeah, can I just add one thing to that? Because I can <laughs> see that this is, a, this is a question that popped up for the second time, which is, by the way, it's a great question. Yeah, uh, sure. I would also like to, to refer back to the explanation uh, in one of the first slides around technology. So the contactless, uh, the contact, contactless tools that hotels can implement will come in very handy now. So whether it may be an app or whether it may be a chat within the app, uh, they could have a few questions that could be asked in a very easy way just to, so the hotel, and the wording framed around this would be to ensure your safety, to ensure your convenience, we have a few questions. So that could, I'm not gonna say that that's the way, but that could be potentially a way that hotels can look at it without again being intrusive. So technology is, is critical. Okay, thank you. So we, can, we could move on to the next two question. Actually, the last question is also part of this badge. So the next question is from Kathy Lowell. She is one of our newest batch students, so, and she is really intrigued with this topic that we're having today. Uh, her question is, according to you, will there be any changes related to the tourist behavior that have a specific impact on the hotel industry? And how big is the new normal going to impact the hotel systems? Okay, that that's a a, question. Another, another fantastic uh, question. Okay, so I, if I'm, uh, let me just see if I got the question right. So basically, her question is around uh, jobs and the impact on jobs and is that uh, I think idea? she's asking about the changes related to, in tourism tourism tourist behavior so the tourists will of course changes their behavior because of the COVID-19 and how big the impact of the new normal to okay. the hotel system okay cool okay. so yes we have seen that there there has been an impact uh, around the world, right? Uh, and you can see that in that uh, second slide from the beginning, the state of the industry, you can see the top 15 players in the world that have tourism and travel as, which includes hotel management, it, uh, hotels, it includes travel, uh, airlines and everything. It did have a massive impact. And specifically you, when you look at countries like the United States, like China, India, like the Philippines, those were the countries that had the highest year-on-year -year, uh, relative growth in terms of how, how much that industry grew in terms of GDP and the gross domestic product. So the impact is clear. Uh, it, it's going to be different in different uh, countries because not every single country will have uh, the tourism and, and travel industry uh, being such a, an important aspect of that economy, right? However, the impact will be uh, felt because every single aspect or every single uh, industry, as we know, has been impacted. I think the only one who has not been impacted in the form of loss of jobs or demand is healthcare, for obvious reasons. Healthcare is perhaps, there's a big strain in, in health. So to, to answer the question, I would say, Yes, there has been an impact. And how long this impact is going to last, I think is, is another important question is, we don't know. Because we don't know how different uh, markets are going to respond. Uh, and again, every single market has a different curve. If we look at New Zealand, if we look at Australia, uh, the curves are really, really flat, right? Australia and New Zealand today are really, really safe places to, to visit because the government was, number one, very quick to take action. 
uh, the, 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 the population in New Zealand and Australia were very committed in adopting these um, directions and these measures, which was critical. Uh, if you look, I'm from Brazil originally. If you look at Brazil, for example, or even the United States, uh, it has become a situation where it's become a political situation and it's been completely misguided by the bad decisions taken by the leaders in those two countries. So what I'm trying to say is each country is different. Each economy is different. The reliance of each economy related to travel and terrorism is different. And also the, the, uh, the different curves related to new cases, contamination, and the spread of the virus are also different. So this, again, an excellent question, but I have to say it's a case-by-case -case scenario. If you look at New Zealand and Australia, I am confident that pretty soon uh, the situation here will be, uh, people will be able to travel again, and people will be able, people are already uh, able to, you know, to, 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 to go to work, to commute, whereas before, you know, it was really strict. Stay at home, stay at home, don't leave home. Whereas now it's starting to, we can see there is a progression, a very pro, a pro, a progressive uh, uh, take on what's happening and we can see the positive results. But because things were, were, were taken into account. So it really depends. And the impact that's going to have in the industry. So it is having an impact. The projections for this year are are considerable, right, given the size. So when we see, I think it's around 30% of the GDP is going to retract and the impact on jobs. However, let's not forget, this crisis is also bringing opportunities, the creation of new jobs. So this is really important. We need to, we need to communicate this, you know. The hygiene case officer is a new profession. Five years ago, who would have thought, or maybe last year, who would have thought that, uh, and maybe in the next six months, if you start looking at your LinkedIn profiles, if you have people in hospitality, you might see hygiene officer as one of the new uh, professions. So that's the beauty of this industry, the resilience, the creativity, and the means to reinvent itself. So I think, yes, I'm not going to say it's all uh, uh, rainbows and unicorns. It's, it's a tough time. But I can guarantee to you, with the measures already being put in place by these big hotels, by the government, and you know, we can see good news as well in the creation of new jobs, it, it, this industry will turn around. It's, it's a very big industry. Let's not forget that this is a massive industry. So it'll, ha it'll have to be much more powerful than that to, 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 you know, to really bring the industry to its knees. You know? So what we're seeing is the commitment from government, from society, it's in everybody's best interests for this industry to, uh, to, uh, to come back. And I, let me share one point here that I, that I think is important. In Australia, uh, there, a lot, I was doing some research for this presentation and there is a, an interesting measure that was put in place by the government, which is called the JobKeeper uh, program. The JobKeeper program was put in place specifically to assist uh, individuals who were on the verge of being laid off or who had to be stood down, right? And interesting enough, in hotel management and hospitality, a lot of businesses are being kept afloat because of this job keeper. So this is a fantastic initiative, which is, you know, maybe it's not 100%, but it's not zero, okay? There is a lifeline and the government is doing the right thing in keeping these businesses, cafes, hotels, uh, you name it, afloat. And eventually this will, we will overcome this. So I hope I have answered the question, but this is, I would say, a case-by-case -case situation and different countries are at different points. But I give, I've given you some examples of countries that are doing this well and countries that are not doing this well, which is the example of the United States, Brazil, and Australia, New Zealand head off because they're doing a fantastic job. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the answer. So for the next batch, uh, batch question, we have four questions. Uh, I grouping, I group this four question because they're actually asking about the price and cost significantly in the hotel industry. So I will uh, read the question to you, all four of them. Um, First is from Casey. 
she actually has two questions, but I think I will read the, her, her, her first question first. So, she said hi to you. <laughs> uh, and since most hotels have to enhance their cleaning or hygiene routines, do you think it will affect the hotel's room price quite significantly? That is the first question. The second is from Rahabian Dimas Dodi. He said that it seemed that the hotel industry needs to go into overdrive in the new normal. It will cost it will cost more money for the hotel to provide the staff in order to assure the best quality services. Do you think that this will impact on the increasing of the hotel price that the guests need to pay compared to the context of pre-COVID-19? That's the second question. The third is from RC Ervina. Uh, her question is how to apply a pricing strategy at the hotel to excite customer purchasing power by increasing cleaning costs will affect the hotel costs uh, and etc. Et it will affect a lot of things. Uh, and the other hand, on the other hand, people might not be able to afford it because of the economic crisis. So it's about uh, pricing strategy for hotel in the hotel okay. industry the last question is from Maria Leonora Ali uh, she is also one of our students uh, <laughs> as well as uh, as all we know there was a reduction of employment regarding to COVID-19 especially for the hotel industry she personally think that the new normal will also increase the number of unemployment because of the new regulation and the increasing in production costs, uh, etc. What, uh, what will the hotel industry do in order to face this problem? Will there be any more reduction of the employment? Okay. Okay, fantastic question. Thank you so much for those very insightful questions. Uh, <laughs> the f yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're all from students? Um, Wait, let me check again. <laughs> so, no, I think the last one is from uh, our student. The other is from outside our department. Great questions. Okay, pricing. Pricing is, I think, perhaps one of the most um, underrated and overlooked uh, variables of the marketing mix. There's a huge, there, and this is historical, okay? So there has been a lot of uh, pushing, uh, toing and throwing. Uh, marketing says it's finance's responsibility. Finances points the finger back at marketing, says it's our responsibility. But the fact of the matter is that pricing is perhaps one of the most, if not the most important key in the marketing mix. And I will tell you why. You can create a fantastic brand with fancy advertising, with you know, uh, fantastic content, but if your pricing is not aligned to the brand, what you will have certainly is a problem, a serious problem, uh, and I'll tell you why. If you're positioning your brand as premium, but you're placing your price as low price, what you're going to generate is an incredible amount of confusion in the minds of customers. Because price, uh, if you look at, uh, it doesn't matter if you look at pre the premium price brands like, you know, the, the, the five-star and luxury hotels or, you know, Rolex, the watch or Mont Blanc, the famous pen, or even the cars, you know, uh, pricing is really important. Going, going, so just wanted to set that uh, expectation first, just to get that clear. So pricing is really important because it does translate what quality, it translates the ability for something to purchase that product. So it, it, has to, it has a critical role in marketing. And if there is a misalignment between brand and price, you could be doing yourself a great disservice, okay? So I just wanted to start by just setting this up and clarifying that point. So having said that, uh, the first question was with pricing, whether or not with all these initiatives taking place, uh, if the, brand, the hotel brands needed to uh, intensify the pricing? That is a fantastic question. Okay. It, it really depends, okay? If you get a company of the size of Grand Hyatt, they have so many hotels, right? And in economics, you have something called uh, economies of scale. When you're talking about a massive 
brand like Grand Hyatt, you can achieve economies of scale. And what Grand Hyatt will certainly do is they will have agreements with suppliers and they will have agreements with companies if they decide to hire a third party to assist in the cleaning. Uh, there is a way to minimize the impact of pricing uh, in, in fees and, and, and uh, hotel fees by doing this, you know, by adopting this, you know, these economies of scale, by negotiating a contract. And the fact that they have so many hotels around the world, this would help to alleviate that intensity of the price. However, what if you're not a Grand Hyatt? So that's a different story. But you can also negotiate with suppliers and you have to find a way to find a supplier which is within your, your, your uh, means of, if you're a smaller hotel, if you're a local hotel, you need to, uh, that has to be aligned to your capability. So understand your costs, understand your fixed costs, understand all of that, uh, that's important. Because if you decide to hire a company and just because, you know, it's the latest company with the latest technology, but the question is, the, the fundamental question is, can you afford that as a business? So in, in those cases, what I would say is the local hotel chains, the smaller boutique hotels, they need to, they need to budget this. They need to understand whether, whether or not they can afford the bigger ones. But they will certainly find, because what's happening in the market is, uh, all of these, um, all of these indirect businesses are also going to pop up, and they're going to be segmented. So you're going to have the premium ones that are going to be catering for the premium hotels, but you'll also have the low fare, which will allow them to incorporate this extra expense. In the beginning, will this have an impact in the bottom line? Most certainly, it will. But uh, what the hotel has to do is. Uh, it has to work in ways, creative ways, to accommodate that and finding new guests, finding new business as a means of minimizing the impact on the bottom line. And, 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 as, and gradually these things will improve. And, and these providers, these suppliers, uh, in the past, uh, you know, with safety, for example, there was a wave of safe, safety that happened after 9-11. A lot of the hotels needed to upgrade their, their safety uh, their safety equipment and higher and that also came but it came to a point where they were able to uh, minimize the impact in the beginning with any new added expense you have to you have to really analyze how you can offset that extra cost because at the end of the day thinking about the consumer the consumer wants that but the consumer doesn't want to pay extra necessarily for that especially because everybody will be offering that so again going back to the consumer decision making if I am evaluating alternatives and I see that this brand is offering me uh, the same hotel, but it has the seal, this brand here is offering me a bed as well, accommodation, but you know, without the seal, and I can see that there is no price difference, I will go with this one. But assuming from the perspective that both hotels are offering uh, the same service with the same uh, hygiene, uh, programs and everything and this one is a bit higher than this one and I know that in the past it wasn't it wasn't the same price the danger there is that cons you can alienate consumers because they're gonna think and say okay so you know last year you know you were you were offering me a bet for this price why has it gone up so much so they run a risk of losing business there so it's important to uh, study this really well uh, a lot of companies will do this in-house. This is, this is a, a way of doing, uh, rationalizing areas of the business that no longer have a necessary purpose because, again, it's the new norm, right? So if they're going to create this new department, this department will come in. Now, look at other departments and see if they're still relevant because a lot of the, the wages and the cost and the overheads could potentially be transferred from this area of the business that is no longer required. So that's another way of looking at the situation. So, uh, but I would, what I wanted to say as well is that it, uh, the brands have to be mindful because uh, uh, most consumers are going to expect this as the new normal. So uh, research would be required to also ask these guests, would you be willing to pay more if you knew that we have a higher standard? So this is, this is, this is potentially a research question for businesses as well, because if, if the VIP guests are happy to pay more, 
because it's going to involve extra technology, then by all means, capitalize on that. You know, translate that, that in the price if it's going to add value. But not all customers are the same. So it's important to understand. And in, in market research, we ask this question, are you willing to pay more if that means you're gonna have extra safety, extra reassurance, you know? And, and I, I, would, I would take it as a staged approach. I think the second question there was around the overdrive, right? Uh, is, the, is, the, is the industry now in overdrive? And is that going to impact on pricing? Um, is, is that the right question? Did I get it right? So what I would say with overdrive is, yes, it, it, we are facing like an unprecedented time uh, in, in hotel management. But again, this is not hotels, it's everywhere. Every single business you look into, every single industry you look into has been affected. Maybe healthcare is the only one which is an exception to this rule, okay? Uh, will there be an impact on pricing? Uh, again, there could be an impact on pricing, especially if decisions are made in a bad way, if uh, people don't analyze their uh, profit and loss statements and uh, don't understand how they can actually uh, incorporate these things, then yes, that could have a serious impact on pricing. But I think most of these, most of these hotel brands, uh, they're so well um, equipped and they do have scale, which will assist them in the first moment to incorporate these measures without having a significant in, in, uh, impact in price. Okay, but again, Every hotel is different. We, have to, we would have to look at the cost structure, the P&Ls, to be more specific and more direct in the answer. But I would say, yes, it's important to, to do your due diligence right before you sign up a new uh, provider, for example. Uh, how are you gonna do this technology? You know, how, how are you gonna implement these things? So it's required to do uh, some homework before making decisions like this, or else you could really have a severe impact there. Uh, the third question here is around pricing strategy and how can we come up with pricing that could excite customers? This is a brilliant question. Uh, I think the industry is at a point uh, in time now that I think the, what, they're, what every single hotelier, it doesn't matter if you're a boutique hotel or if you're a small local hotel, what you really want at this stage is number one, for people to start traveling again. Number two, you want to see smiling faces going, uh, entering the door of your hotel. So pricing strategy now could really, could really be a, a, a creative way to attract customers back. How can you do this? You can do this in a series of different ways. And I think one of the, most, one of the smartest ways to do this is value-added services. Okay, Value-added services are things you can bundle that you can add to a specific package, which will add a lot of value because people are not gonna see this as being more expensive. Again, it's perception. People are gonna see, okay, uh, with these bundling services and, the, and these bundling services could be in entertainment at, ho at hotels. It could be, uh, you know, different dining experiences in hotels uh, and not necessarily thinking about the hygiene. The hygiene has to be a given. This needs to be regardless. It's a non-negotiable, as I said. So to excite customers, have these exciting packages, you know, themes, uh, entertainment. So this is a way, and you could charge a little bit more for those things because you're adding value to the service. It's not just a bare service. It's a value added that you're, uh, you can offer the guest. And if the guest is happy to pay for that value add in the form of entertainment, in the form of additional amenities, then it's extra money going to the hotel. So it, it is, I think, a creative way to use pricing in this particular point in time to really excite people, you know? Uh, and again, just be mindful of discounts because discounts, again, when we think about branding, if you are a boutique hotel, if you're premium, if you're luxury, uh, you're not about saying 50% off. You're not about saying, you know, that's not really how uh, that's not part of their strategy. Why? Because if you start discounting your brand heavily, even in a moment like this, what happens, what you can face down the track is something called brand erosion. 
So this, could, this maybe could help you now in the short term. But then the question is, are you attracting the right guests to your hotel? Maybe you're not. You're attracting a price sensitive guest, which is not your core target audience. So you have to be mindful of that. And you have to think, okay, who is my target audience? Who, what, what do they value? They value sophistication and luxury and they're willing to pay for that. So I'm not gonna touch on the price because down the track, this will scar the reputation of my brand. I will be seen as a cheap brand. And you can start to create a lot of confusion because then the, the, your loyal guests, your so-called VIP or loyal guests that would normally come to you will say, hey, who, are, who is this crowd here in, in this hotel? I'm going to the, I'm going to the competition. You know? So again, pricing is important. Discounts is something we have to be very, very mindful. Hotels do it in a smart way, which is called yield management, and airlines do it as well, which is the, the price of, the, of, of, of a specific uh, bedroom or a seat in an airline company fluctuates, but it fluctuates within parameters. It doesn't go way above or way low because, you know, and those parameters are put in place to ensure that the pricing will, A, uh, guarantee profitability, B, ensure that the brand is still aligned and it's still uh, you know, representative of what they mean. You know, in the case of Hyatt, it's still a, 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 a premium brand. So consumers are kind of like expecting to pay within that range. So, uh, but think about value added because value added is that additional service. It's that additional uh, convenience factor that you can add to the equation that a lot of guests would be happy to pay for. Again, research is important just to calibrate the right offering. And I think the, the, the last question of this batch was around the reduction of employment, right? Uh, if we should be worried of the reduction of employment. Um, yes and no, right? I think it has hit the economy we've seen, but at the same time, with every crisis comes opportunities, right? So. I would like to stress again the, the, the whole idea about hygiene officers. It's a newly created role. Uh, let's say I had no idea that they would come up with something like this. And now every single hotel from Grand Hyatt and rest assured, most hotels will follow suit because this is a, this is a non-negotiable, right? In this day and age, if you have uh, five or more people in the same, in the same place, you need to take that into account, right? So, uh, there is a projection which is looking at a reduction of employment this year, but uh, you know, with barriers opening, with things slowly coming back, the economy will start kicking back again, and that is good for that's good news for this industry because people will start traveling again, and this curve will slowly and gradually start to recover, which means jobs will be created again new opportunities will come about. So it's like we're traveling in the middle of a storm with, you know, the windshields are on, but this, this storm will pass. That's, I think this is perhaps the, 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 one of the key things I wanted to say. It's a hard moment, but it will pass. And when it passes, those individuals who are well-educated, well-prepared, well-equipped, will have an added advantage you know, because it is a competitive industry. It is a big industry, as we could see by the numbers. So uh, if you are aspiring to become a hotelier, to be in this industry, this is a moment to really invest in your preparation, to invest in your background, to study, to, to make connections and get prepared. Because once this thing is over, uh, if you're doing your homework and your competitor is not, you have an advantage. So this is the positive uh, key thing I wanted to say. So just be mindful of that. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your insightful answer, Fernando. Yeah, we, we actually still have some more questions. Yeah, it's brilliant. Sadly, we were running out of time. Mm -hmm. That's fine. <laughs> Look, I'm 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 good to go. If you guys are good to go, I'm good to go. Oh, I can I can actually, I can spend more. Actually, I will forward the question to Mbak Agustin so you uh, for you to answer it by email later, perhaps. That's fine. That's no okay. Problem. Uh, yeah, to the audience, we were very sorry that we are not able to answer all the questions live due to, due to the time limit. Um, okay, I think that's all from me. I will hand the room back to Mbak Agustina. Mbak Agustina. 
okay thank you Ms. Arin, for assisting us for the question and answer session yes. thank you mr fernando for the thank amazing you very presentation much. and sharing thank information you. for us thank, thank you, you for uh, atma jaya university thank you for team thank you for mr doni thank you for uh, all participants in here so today we are going to close and mm -hmm. thank you for everyone yeah. just just a reminder that yeah. i know the the recording of the session will be uploaded into youtube okay. uh, so besides sending the answers of to all the questions that has been answered or be, that's not being answered through email we also probably going to put it on the comment section of the youtube link so everybody can see the answers okay. i think that's gonna be a great okay. idea yeah okay thank you mr doni okay thank you stay safe and health everyone Thank you very much. Thank you. I really, Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank, Thank you so much. You too. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, Tim Fernando, for a great presentation. I think um, a lot of my students answer and uh, ask questions because they're very interested in the topic. Uh, Doni, terima kasih atas kesempatannya ini. Mbak Sinta. Yeah, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Juga. Zarin, thank you, yeah. Terima kasih, Mbak Zarin. And I hope for your visit next time to our university, Tim and Fernando. Mm -hmm. Kami terima kasih, Buya. We are the one who actually have to say thank you to Atma Jaya and Superstar. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Agustin just asked. So, we are in the same room, so yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you so one much. One meter, one meter of social distancing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. So uh, once again, uh, we were, uh, from the hotel school, uh, we would like to say thank you to Superstar once again for the support, and of course, definitely to Atma Jaya for all this uh, collaboration that we've done so far from all the previous years until right now. Uh, Tim and Fernando, you want to add something? I just wanted to reiterate and say um, a very big thank you again um, uh, to Superstar and to. to Thank you, Miss Chitra. Uh, it's lovely to see you again. And um, yeah, we look forward to furthering this collaboration. I definitely look forward to coming back and having another delicious lunch with you and the students. Uh, and um, yeah, um, we, we've, we've got more topics as well. So um, we, can, we can deliver another presentation um, where we're happy to, um, to come and present to your students. Fantastic questions again today, which, uh, which is really encouraging. It's always nice. Um, after we do a, a, a lecture like that to get some really insightful and intelligent questions. So I think that shows the, the caliber of the teaching at Upmajaya and, and the quality of your students. So we're, we're really happy to, to, to be collaborating. with you. Yes. Fernando, you want to add anything? Yeah, just, or? Once, once again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, just, just, you know, to be here. And I, as I said, I'm passionate about education. And I could, I second the words that uh, Tim said, we can see through the quality of the questions, how insightful and how good these students are. And I really hope that we can have some of these students in the future with us because we need, you know, this is all, this is what we stand for, you know, this, this quality, this high caliber, this is the standard by which we measure ourselves. So I just wanted to acknowledge that again and say this awesome. Thank you. Send some of them also there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bu Chitra, Bu Zarin, yeah. also superstar. We also wait for you to come to our campuses in Australia, hopefully soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Stay healthy. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. I'll um, call you on another Zoom link, Fernando. Cool. Can I shut it down? Yeah, I think so.